advisability of action. So where do we go from here? Should the U.S. remain the enforcer of last, sometimes first, resort? If it does, will there ever, ever be much difference in policy, in foreign policy between Republican and Democratic administrations, other than in matters of emphasis, strategy, style, or timing? I'm reminded when Khrushchev said the difference between Kennedy and Nixon was the difference between Tweedledee and Tweedledum. I'm not as cynical as that, but from a long-distance perspective, that was what was offered. What Obama has learned from history, I think, is that given the fundamental assumptions made by past several generations, no president has much wiggle room. He or she can nip and tuck at policy, but the ship of state continues fundamentally in the same direction, pursuing the same goals. What Obama can learn our history is, however, I think much different. Policy can change fundamentally only if there is a paradigm of shift. History shows that in international relations, this doesn't happen much. Um, in 1648, we'll go way back, the Peace of Westphalia established the modern uh, paradigm of international relations. States were to be, were to be individual entities, unbeholden to outside authority, with complete freedom of action within their own borders. Between states, war was the arbiter. In 1918, the new next shift took place. The victors of World War I established a new framework of positive international law, as distinguished from natural law, to govern interactions between states and to outlaw war, still accepting that within their borders, governments held complete sway. Of course, workable enforcement wasn't achieved and the League of Nations fell apart. Between 1944 and 1948, a third paradigm was implemented. The so-called free world enshrined the principles of economic cooperation, we might call it open door, individual human rights, arbitration of disputes, and economic sanctions as the preferred means for achieving compliance with international norms. Enforcement remained the weak link, however, and FDR proposed a collective security organization, the UN, shored by four policemen, US, UK, USSR, China. Stalin and Churchill agreed with the concept, tacitly accepting that in a real world, some pigs are more equal than others. That is, there was no way of getting around the fact that size, meaning the size of one's economy and military, as well as territorial expanse, came with those things, came power, responsibility, and privilege. The institutional recognition of the four policemen, of course, was the granting of five permanent memberships on the UN Security Council, but the prerogative that this gave the great powers stopped short, really, of legitimating the full sway that they actually did exercise. And so any number of controversies arose in which certain policemen, if you will, exercised outsized influence. In the Suez Crisis of 1956, for example, the superpowers had more say than the merely great powers. This is, uh, and of course, the US and USSR trumped France and Britain. And indeed, um, this is, and this is still where we remain today, with the U.S. now being the sole superpower. We can, and may, continue to exercise this role. It is a deeply uncomfortable one, I believe, for most Americans, raised as we are, to be able to recite all men are created equal, even in our sleep. Um, or we can, that is Obama can, attempt yet another paradigm shift one that will open wide the possibilities for international relations and remove the straitjacket of the unipolar security system. And here it is. <laughs> My heresy. Uh, economic sanctions have become the preferred means of exerting pressure on recalcitrant, disruptive, or violent nations. But the ultimate sanctions, which would exert pressure on allies, frenemies, and enemies alike, would be with the withdrawal of the U.S. as a guarantor, in recognition of the fact that the new heavyweights, if you will, have the strength to pick up these burdens, but will only do so if we set them down. If the United States were to withdraw once again behind its lovely wide oceans, it would force the European Union, China, Japan, Russia, and the ABC countries of South America to confront the fact that they will have to spend more of their blood and treasure to sustain the world we all want. A world in which unlawful violence is resolutely repressed. Economic cooperation is the order of the day. And borders are treated as sacrosanct. 
Even more challenging will be the problem of enforcing international norms of human rights within domestic boundaries, but this too can eventually be accomplished by the international community as it bends history in the direction of justice. Now, considering the frightening prospects which we, uh, with which history continually presents us, and I, every time you think of the morning newspaper, you're confronted with this again, such as the recently revealed underground tunnel network in which Iran is cooking up nuclear mayhem, for example, it is understandably, understandably tempting to believe that we can't, we mustn't let go, that only the U.S. has the power, perhaps even some would say the courage, to stop rogue nations bent on upending the world order. But I remind you that it was Ireland and Finland that first proposed and were the first signatories of the nuclear non-proliferation non treaty that now guides global policy. The weapons of the weak are sometimes the most potent weapons of all. How would the U.S. go about uh, redelegating or even abdicating the role of international policemen? How would we encourage the world to think about a world in a way almost without the U.S.? Not that we're going to go anywhere. But if the U.S. wasn't there, what would happen? What would others have to do? What dicta might our president set down? What demands might he make? What institutional reforms would he propose? I don't know. But I do know that a person as talented and bright as President Barack Obama could figure it out. With a broader way, vision of which way history needs to bend, Obama would not only learn from the past, but guide us towards a more prosperous, more peaceful future. Thank you. Thank you.